They've advocated that we be arrested. They've had their favorite media figures openly speculate about the possibility that we would be. They detained my partner for nine hours. They announced that there was a terrorism investigation pending in the UK. And they refused to give my lawyers any information at all about whether there was a grand jury investigation, whether there was an indictment under seal. Very unusual behavior when dealing with these lawyers in particular who say that they can always get at least something. So they wanted us to have this kind of uncertainty about whether or not they would take action upon our return to the U.S. That's very clear. And it's easy, I guess, to say it doesn't seem likely that it'll happen, but when those threats are being directed at you, you take them seriously. Um, and, and so we did, um, but then obviously assessed that the risk was low enough, mostly because we didn't think that they would be so counterproductive or self-destructive to do it, um, and we're willing, therefore, to get on a plane and come back. Originally, the government said that they were willing to have conversations about what that might entail, and then ultimately, I guess, decided that they weren't willing to have those conversations because they just stopped returning calls and stopped giving any information. And so they just expressly refused to say whether or not there were whether there was a pending indictment under seal or whether or not we were the targets of a grand jury investigation. Your trip isn't over. Um, it doesn't just have to happen at the airport. What are you concerned about for both Glenn and Laura? And Laura, if you could describe how your experience coming through the airport today compared with your previous experiences. I mean, you know, the other risk that I think that we face as journalists right now are the risk of subpoena, where the government subpoenas our materials to try to get information about our source. Um, and we know that the government has been using the border as a sort of legal no man's land to get access to journalist materials. I mean, I've experienced that for six years where I've been detained, interrogated, and had equipment seized at the border. Um, and never told, you know, for, for what reason that's happening. How so, many times have you been stopped? You know, I've, I've asked the government to answer that question and they won't tell me. Um, I s think close to 40 or more. Um, I've got FOIA's out and uh, as soon as I can get a precise count, I'll certainly publish it. So, I mean, the risks of subpoena are, are very real. And um, and as you know, as, as you indicate, I mean, the fact that we're here is not a um, uh, an indication that there isn't a threat. We know there's a threat. We know there's a threat from what the government is saying in terms of how they're talking about this journal, this, the journalism that we're doing. And um, and but we're, I mean, the, the reason we're here is because we're not going to you know succumb to those threats. You're not covered by the uh, First Amendment in the United States. What kind of fears do you have in England when you travel and when you come home at night? The, um, I mean, I was first went back from Hong Kong and there was a sort of test case and I sort of wondered if we'd be, uh, if I would be stopped in the way in. The travel. guinea pig, we call it. Yeah, the <laughs> guinea pig. Um, I wasn't stopped. Then the Guardian lawyers briefed me on how to deal with a grand jury. So the second time in, I thought maybe I would get stopped, but I haven't been. I, I do get stopped on the way into Britain, which is kind of reverse, normally just for about 20 minutes. And they send me to a sort of sin bin, uh, check my passport details, and then say, um, your passport's been reported uh, stolen or missing. Well, the only person that reported it stolen or missing is me. Uh, I, I put in a formal complaint last month and we'll see what happens. Um, there is a, a, we've not been told this officially, but there is a criminal investigation underway uh, in Britain into the Guardian. Uh, so theoretically, Alan and myself and others could end up in jail. But our feeling is that the British government will probably back away from that. The last thing they need is a two or three year fight in the courts over press freedom. So I think that if it goes to the Director of Public Prosecutions, they probably won't do it. But we can't, we can't be sure. I mean, I'd like to say a personal note. I'm, I do not plan to travel to the United Kingdom anytime soon, um, given uh, after the experience that David had at the, uh, at the border and the, and the lack of press freedoms that they have in that country. So it's, it's um, uh, a, uh, not a good indication for a democracy. What are your plans for the United States? Will you be staying here long? Glenn, will you be moving back? Laura, will you be moving back? I mean, I think, you know, I think that this first step, I mean, since we didn't know what today held, we haven't been doing a lot of long-term thinking because we, we had no idea what the outcome would be of our deplaning. Um, 
But I think that once we got on the airplane this morning, it was a commitment not just to come back for this one time, but to come back whenever we want, which is our prerogative as American citizens, and it ought to be our right, not just to come back, but to come back without fear of that kind of harassment to even have it under our thought process. Um, so I don't know what Laura's long-term plans are, I mean, but for me, you know, I have a book coming out next month, um, and I want to be able to come to the U.S. to talk about the issues that it raises. Um, I have a lot of journalistic colleagues here with whom I'm working. I want to be able to freely travel to work with them and work on stories in the United States and to talk about the things I think need to be talking about. So I do think this sort of presages more visits to the U.S. I mean, I've, I started working outside of the United States um, uh, and, and setting up um, my edit studio in, in Berlin before I was contacted by Snowden, and because of this was repeated um, targeting that I had at the border. And so this was the decision I'd made before um, uh, working on the NSA material. And it, for me, the decision is I don't feel confident I can protect source material in the United States right now. I mean, it's, it's just um, I certainly can't cross the border with it uh, or with my, my equipment or anything that I consider to be sensitive. Um, and so my plan is to finish editing and then return. I mean, I, I, I absolutely plan to return. What's happening in Germany um, is, I mean, what they're referring to it is, is a church-like commission hearing in, happening in Germany, um, looking at the, the implications and the dangers of surveillance, and that this will probably be going on for, I think they say, at least a year. And so it's a significant um, um, uh, parliamentary inquiry into what's happening. We don't know yet what impact it will have, um, and there certainly are people who are calling for Snowden to testify, and I think it's going to be very difficult to, um, uh, be, given the, the, the making of the, of the committee, that, that I think he will be invited to, to testify. And I think that would be, um, I mean, as well they should, because he is a witness and can, can answer the questions that they're um, seeking to. What worries he to be the most? What are his concerns now and where he stands in Russia? I mean, you know, I don't think it's any secret that I talk to him regularly. Um, and, you know, I feel like a lot of what we do has an impact on him because things, the choices that we make can have an influence on how he's perceived or even what his legal situation is. So, you know, we certainly talked about our plans to come back and, and he was very supportive of that. Um, and, you know, I think that his situation in Russia is what it's basically been for the last eight months, which is that, that he's in a country that he didn't choose to be in, that he was forced to remain in by the United States revoking his passport and then threatening other countries not to allow him safe transit. But at the same time, uh, that alternative, as imperfect as it might be, um, is certainly preferable to the alternative of not being in Russia, which is being put into a supermax prison in the United States for the next 30 years, if not the rest of his life. And so, um, given how likely of an outcome that was, and he knew that was when he made his choice, I think he's very happy with his current situation. Do you know what kind of, whether he's still, whether he's actively being pursued now? It seems like recently he's been speaking a lot, speaking out a lot more, like giving telepresence talks. Does he feel safer? I mean, I, you know, I think his, it, I mean, it's really kind of an extraordinary thing that's sort of been underappreciated, the fact that he made the choice to go before the world and say that this leak, which is the largest national security leak in American history, the one that has made the American national security state angrier than any other, is something that I did. And I'm not only saying that I did it, but I want to tell you my rationale for why I did it, and I'm proud of it. And, you know, eight months later, he is further away from the grasp of the United States than he has ever been. And, you know, I think that... Um, he feels uh, not just um, a, a duty, but a, a sort of a, a, a responsibility to participate in the debate that he helped to trigger around the world. And the fact that he's able to do that is one of the reasons why I think it's so important that he hasn't been um, in prison. I don't think he's ever going to feel safe, um, but I think he feels confident enough to be speaking out, and especially because he, he feels like the focus will remain on the revelations and all that in person. And it doesn't sound, sorry, just to follow up, it doesn't sound like there's any pressure on you to get, to like use you to get to him at this point. I'm not, yeah, I don't think we've been, I mean, I, I don't know, I don't think we could help the U.S. government get to him in Russia. Um, so I think, you know, he feels like he's been given asylum under the law. It's recognized by most countries around the world, and I think he feels reasonably confident that the U.S. government can reach through that asylum and get him. What's the most important revelation do you think that came from all the documents that were released because of Edward Snowden? For me, the most 
significant revelation is the ambition of the United States government and its four English-speaking allies to literally eliminate privacy worldwide, which is not hyperbole. The goal of the United States government is to collect and store every single form of electronic communication that human beings have with one another and give themselves the capacity to monitor and analyze those communications. So even though I've been warning for a long time about this being an out of control rogue surveillance state long before I ever heard the name Edward Snowden, to see in the documents that that not only is their ambition but something that they're increasingly close to achieving was to me by far the most significant goal, something that I don't think anyone in the world knew or understood. And Every other revelation is really just a subset of that one. And just to follow up, do you think that nuclear terrorism or any of the threats against the United States would justify that kind of searching of the world? I mean, would we want a nuclear terrorist to go off in New York? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't think that the desire to detect what a small number of people are doing justifies ubiquitous mass suspicionless surveillance. And I actually think that the system that says collect everything makes it actually harder to find the things that they claim they're looking for because when you collect so much it's really impossible almost to find the Boston Marathon attack or the attempted detonation of a bomb or in Times Square or any of the other things that the surveillance state as ubiquitous as, ubiquitous as it is fails to detect. The Obama administration has prosecuted more whistleblowers than all other administrations combined. What is the future whistleblower? Well, I mean, I think, um, I'm not going to go into too many details, but I think what we're seeing is actually more people coming forward, you know? More people realizing that, if, that, they, that, that their conscience is telling them that there are things that they know of that, um, uh, that should be public. And I um, can't go into lots of details. I mean, one that is actually it has been reported was a, was a story that Glenn did with Jeremy Scahill, which was on um, the targeted killing program and how they use metadata to um, assassinate people without actually knowing the identities of the people. And, and that, that came, that, that information was a, that was a, that was a source that came forward. So I think, um, and, you know, we're, I mean, I think, you know, from the post 9-11 era, I think there are a lot of people who have sort of a heavy conscience of what has happened and have a lot of information. And I think that maybe um, the, the risk that Snowden take will, has taken opens up a space where, um, uh, where people will maybe feel that now is the time to come forward. What tips do you have for journalists working in the United States regarding you know, securing their data? Okay. Um, so, uh, and you're talking about people who are doing like national security reporting? Um, so I'm, I'm on, uh, Glenn and I are both on the board of an organization called the Freedom of the Press Foundation. We just published a blog about a, a tool that's called Tails, which is a operating system that runs on a either USB stick or a SD um, uh, uh, disk that is a sort of all-in-one encryption tool that you can use for you know, PTP and um, an encryption jabber. And, and, and it's just quite, it's just really secure. And, and we, are, we, we didn't talk about it for a long time because we didn't necessarily want to draw attention to it so that it would be um, avoid being targeted. But we figured by now the intelligence agencies who are paying attention would, would sort of, it would be on their radar. So it's, it's actually it's an, a really important tool for, for journalists. Um, and I think um, there are huge concerns for international journalists and their communications and how they protect sources and um, that these revelations have exposed. So for instance, inf information that's foreign information that's transits the United States gets talked about. And so how are you going to protect your sources? And how do, how do intelligence agencies behind the scenes share information? And those are all the, these are all things that I think will continue to come forward as more um, sources come forward and more reporting is done. And, Glenn, can you speak to persecution of Barrett Brown for his sources? Yeah, I mean, I've written a lot about that story, um, so I don't know how many people know the background, but, you know, I mean, I think there are a lot of cases over the last five years of people being persecuted legally and in other ways for their journalism. They don't all get the visibility that <coughs> the NSA story has gotten. Um, but, you know, I think that's really the critical thing, is I think sometimes people look at other countries where journalists are thrown in prison and think, well, if that's not happening here, then it means <clears throat> that we have a free press. But one of the ways that freedom of the press is eroded is through continuously threatening journalists. James Risen is here. He actually faces the threat of prison from the Justice Department if he doesn't reveal his sources. And there are cases like Barrett's and others where people who have a lot less visibility who are actually being prosecuted and, and threatened with prosecution for doing journalism that the state dislikes. After, after the fact, they were trying to say that he was uh, uh, aiding and abetting 
this source who they still apparently haven't determined was Jeremy Hammond, and I don't know, I don't know if you know, if you've seen that lately, but I... Yeah, the superseding indictment with that source. I mean, yeah. th th I mean that, the reason why I think that the most significant episode of the last five years when it comes to press freedom was the characterizing formally of James Rosen of Fox News as a co-conspirator with his source was because that really would enable the government to criminalize all forms of journalism. It's virtually impossible to work with the source in a way that would immunize yourself from those kind of allegations. Um, and so I think that indictment is, again, an example of that theory being implemented, although with a lot less attention because he's Bear Brown and not, you know, the Washington Bureau Chief of Fox News, but just as dangerous in terms of the precedent of it. Thanks. How many days, months, or years worth of uh, stories are left in the Edward Sony document, would you say? Um, you know, I hope, I, I mean, I think about how many days and months and years are left for me, and so I am hoping that the number is relatively short, but whatever it is, um, that number is probably a lot shorter than the overall amount of time that needs to happen for there to be reporting. Um, it's an extraordinarily deep and profound set of materials that he furnished, and you know, I think that it's critical that all of the newsworthy items get published that should be published within the journalistic formula that we've been using, um, even if we're not the ones who, who do it. And even if it doesn't create huge public attention because they feel like they're inured to it or, or hurt at all, I think the obligation journalistically is to make sure that all of that material that should come out is. And so, you know, I think there'll, become, there'll come some point when we will start thinking about other ways for that to happen. And maybe I'm, I, as a follow-up, maybe I missed you talking about this before, but how do you feel the U.S. public has reacted, and do you feel like there's been a sufficient amount of, of reaction from the U.S. Uh, public to these stories? I mean, I think the number of people in this room, 10 months after we first did our reporting, is a testament to how much this story has resonated. And, you know, because I live outside the United States, I think I'm probably a little bit more attentive to how it has resonated internationally, which sometimes I think gets lost in the debate in the United States. But really, I mean, literally around the globe, people think not only about surveillance, but about individual privacy in the digital age and the trustworthiness of government officials to exercise power in the dark and the proper role of journalism vis-a-vis -vis the state and a whole variety of other topics, including the role that the United States government is playing in the world in a radically different light than they did prior to this reporting. And I, you know, I see the Im impact when I go other places and talk about the story, how much it continues to resonate. And I, I know I've said this before over many months, many times, and there's a little bit of skepticism when I say it in some circles, but I say it because it really is true. In my opinion, the stories that are the most significant and that are the most shocking and that will have the broadest and most enduring implications are the ones that we're currently working on and have not yet been reported. And so I think it's really hard to assess while we're still in the middle of the story, which is really where we are, um, what the ultimate consequences would be. I don't think we know, but for me, of course, there's some indifference or some apathy. There's some jaded, you know, sort of cynicism, but in general, um, the public reaction has been, speaking for myself, just vastly larger and more consequential than even in my wildest dreams I imagine could happen when I started working on the story. The NSA reportedly instituted a blanket policy of withholding records from people who want to know if the agency has spied on them. And any response to that, and also this issue of nonprofits uh, being spied on here? I mean, it's, I'll only break news on democracy now. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it, you know, as I said, I mean, I think some of the most significant stories are left to come, um, and it's hard to preview them when they haven't gone through the journalistic process and to talk about ones that we haven't published, but obviously Edward Snowden is aware of what's in the material that he gave us. Well, if we decided just to release it all, um, then all of the questions would be, why did you so recklessly upload to the internet all of these materials without first vetting them? Why did you expose this, the identity of this person or blow this program? Or did why weren't you more careful? And when Snowden came to us, he had a very clear idea about how he wanted the materials to be reported. If he just wanted it all released to the public, he could have just done that himself. He knows how the internet works. He wouldn't have needed us. Um, that's exactly what he didn't want and demanded that we make an agreement with him that that wasn't how we were going to publish these materials. He knew that in order for this debate that he wanted to be triggered to happen, it needed to be done in a way that the focus wouldn't be on why are you reckless and why are you helping the terrorists and why did you expose the identity of this person and instead have it be on 
what the NSA is doing. And I think that choice of his was vindicated, and that's why we've adhered to the agreement we've done. And as far as the method, I mean, we go through the documents, we find the ones that we think are most newsworthy, we do the reporting necessary for us to complete the picture, we consult with experts, we work with editors, and then the minute the story is ready for publication, we publish it. Um, and all of us have been working without stop for 10 straight months doing that. And I think you can look at it in one way and say there's a lot of documents that haven't been published, but I think the better way and more accurate way to look at it is to say that in the 10 month period since we've gotten the documents, there's an extraordinary number of documents that have been released. There have been hundreds of articles written about very complicated material, almost all of which have been completely shielded from any serious questioning in terms of their accuracy or their reliability. And I think that's inspired confidence in the readership and in the public that what it is that we're reporting is solid and accurate. And ultimately, I think that was the most important thing for having the debate proceed in a meaningful and constructive way. It's hard for us to talk about things that we haven't actually reported um, because it just wouldn't be a meaningful way to talk about it because the reporting that we do uh, oftentimes you read a document and you think you know the meaning of it and then you go and do research and read other documents and consult with experts and it turns out that the meat understanding that you had of it originally isn't the accurate understanding so I try really hard not just to spout off about things that we haven't gone through the process of reporting having said that I will just say that in general the relate the, there almost is no division between the private sector and the NSA or the private sector and the Pentagon when it comes to the American national security state they really are essentially one and so to talk about whether or not um, there are protections on how Booz Allen uses the material versus how the NSA uses it almost assumes falsely that there is this really strict separation. They call each other partners because that's what they are. Um, and they're indispensable in every way to the national security state, which is why Edward Snowden had access to all these materials, not as an NSA employee, but as a Booz Allen employee. I mean, first, speaking for myself, I would like to see the debate be about not whether the U.S. should be collecting metadata under a specific provision of the Patriot Act 215, but the broader question of whether or not we want to empower the government to monitor and surveil people who are suspected of absolutely no wrongdoing whatsoever, essentially to engage in mass surveillance. Is that really a proper function of the state? And even beyond just domestically, why should one government in particular turn the internet from what it was intended to be in its greatest promise, which is a tool of freedom and human exploration and liberation, into the most oppressive tool of human control and surveillance ever known in history? And so I don't think anybody thinks that there's no legitimate form of surveillance. I think that it's perfectly legitimate for the government to surveil people about whom there's evidence real evidence to believe and convince a court to believe that they're engaged in actual wrongdoing, a targeted surveillance of people for whom there's probable cause or some similar standard. Um, but mass surveillance, suspicionless surveillance of our private communications, I think is without any justification whatsoever. And I think the national security state ought to be reined in and converted from a system of mass surveillance into one of targeted surveillance. Do you still reach out to the NSA, White House, or DNI to say, here's what we're about to go with, and give them an opportunity to say, please, not that part, or do you cut that out? No, in every single story that we published, every single story that we published, and by we, I mean just any media organization with which I've worked, and I think with which everybody has worked on these stories, we have gone to all of the people who might have information to give us to enable our reporting to be better, including the NSA and the GCHQ. And we not only ask for their comment, but give them an opportunity to argue why certain information shouldn't be published. In the overwhelming majority of cases, their arguments about why we shouldn't publish end up being rejected because they're usually just vague invocations of national security cliches and not anything specific. But in a couple of cases, they have identified specific harms that they thought would accrue, and we thought the information wasn't particularly useful anyway, and so we ended up being convinced on our own accord not to publish it. Um, but yeah, I think it would be irresponsible not to let them tell you what they want to tell you about the story, just like you go to anybody. I don't think any countries, um, you know, I, I can't talk to closed societies like China. I don't know what, you know, their reactions have been. Um, but I think open governments, open countries, their reaction has not been let's pool our resources to match and replicate 
the capabilities of the United States. Instead, it is instead, let's figure out how to defend ourselves from what essentially is this digital invasion of the privacy of our citizens and, and our elected leaders. And I know in Brazil, for example, and in Germany, the two countries that probably have been the most affected by the revelations and where the reaction has been most intense, there has been very serious debate and resources devoted to figuring out how to build defenses um, to protect the sanctity of, of the privacy of their, their communications. You, quickly, your uh, President Obama, uh, data collection despite uh, calling for some reforms. Your response to it? I mean, I, you know, I, I think that it's, you know, President Obama likes to parade around as some sort of, you know, King Solomon figure in between the excesses of the NSA and those who are raising concerns about it and trying to balance it and come up with some reasonable centrist approach. I mean, that's generally his political brand. The reality is, is that he's presided over this out of control system for five years um, and has never expressed a single inclination to rein it in in any way. Um, so the fact that he's continuing it for as long as he can, um, I think is the opposite of surprising. I mean, he is an advocate of the system over which he presided for so many years. I mean, I think he's one of the obstacles to reform, not a vehicle for it.